Hello, I'm Elaine Stevens and I want to welcome you to Artbeat. In this vast, eclectic, and very unusual array of art, which includes pottery, charred teddy bears, chicken heads, tattoo machines, and even a magnificent surfboard, lives the mind of an unusual artist, Ian Childers. And you're going to meet him right here on Artbeat, where art is the heartbeat of South Mississippi. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this message. Welcome to Artbeat. I am so inspired. Our artist today has a variety of work, as you saw in the first segment, that you're going to be dying to see, and getting to know him has been a real treat. So I see all this wild stuff around me from, not it's not ordinary, but it's beautiful and symmetrical, to the unusual. So who is Ian Childers? How do we pinpoint you, or do you even want us to? Uh, uh I don't know if I want to. It's, it's a, <laughs> I didn't it's think a complex so. question. I change from day to day, I think. Um, Mostly I'm just a guy that likes to make things, and I like a lot of sci-fi TV. That's about it. Well, I mean, when you say the maker of things, I, we've had a lot of artists here on Artbeat, as everyone knows, and, and usually they just glory in that word, artist. But you are truly a maker of things. So how do, how do you explain that? Uh, I was raised in a very blue-collar household. My stepdad could fix anything. Um, and I really kind of, I kind of fell into wanting to be able to fix things like him as a kid. I looked up to him a lot. So as I grew up and I learned I would get into things and start learning how to make them, how to fix them. Um, and then I kind of fell into art. And art is just making things. When you take everything else away, even if you're just making a painting, it's still just an addition of materials until you have a thing. So I think this is what I needed to do, is more kind of creative than being a plumber. <laughs> but it's still, it's on the basis. But you'd it's, probably it's, be a good one. Yeah, it's a blue collar job though. It's work. It's, it's all hard work. That's all it is. So I know that you're a professor. Yes. You teach art. Tell us a little bit about that. And you come from Rome, Georgia. I work at Shorter University in Rome, Georgia. I'm an adjunct professor. Um, it's an awesome Wouldn't you job. love to have a professor that looked like this? <laughs> I never had a professor that looked like this. I don't know. What <laughs> is that, are you hitting on me? Uh, yeah, I am. <laughs> so were they. <laughs> um, I love my job. I think it's great. And one of the things about teaching, or just teaching and making is I, like to, I can teach people how to make things. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm into. I like to make different things. Um, everything is mildly related to itself, but for the most part, I try new things every year. So these were just an experiment that I came up with one day and started making bowls. I have to touch equations. them because there's something really lustrous about these. I mean, they shine, they sparkle, and you tell me your secret about that. Well, these are, it's a, a crystalline glazed bowl. Basically, I throw the bowl on a potter's wheel, and then there's a very special firing process and glaze process that goes into actually grow this sparkly crystal surface on the, on the pot itself. And it's on a lot of the work in here because this is one of my specialties. Um, you fire the, the kiln very fast up to about 2300 degrees, mm -hmm. which is extremely hot. And then the rate of cool allows crystals to grow in the, clay, in the glaze. So it's very kind of scientific and nerdy. So when you say your specialties, do you mean this particular type of pottery or is pottery one of your specialties? Pottery is one of my specialties. This glaze on pottery is another kind of more specific specialty within pottery. To Ian Childers. To me, yes. yes. Absolutely. I love the way artists handle their own artwork. I'm caressing it as if it were an infant child, and I love the way you grab it. Like this? Yeah, I love that. I mean, I'm so afraid um, I'm going to break that. So tell me, you don't believe in the fragility of art, obviously. Oh, I do. I enjoy the fragility of art. Um, the teddy bears here are, are supposed to be fr fragile. They're Shall fleeting. we visit them? Let's should, go and visit okay. the teddy bears. Um, Let's walk over here, and we'll take a look at them. Well, this certainly does not look like your ordinary teddy bear collection. No, and this is not. This, is, um, this was actually a response to an old professor who would bring me teddy bears and see if I could make something with them. And May I'm, I pick one up? Absolutely. All right, let's see if I can do this. Now, this teddy bear looks like he's been harmed, so do explain. Well, I get these teddy bears from the county dump. Um, they've been discarded by children as they grow old and they no longer want teddy bears. And then I take them and I actually dip them in the leftover clay from all the stuff that I make. I have this, it's like a slurry of clay. So I dip the teddy bear in there and then I hang it up with a thumbtack or a piece of string from the wall and let it dry. When it's dry, I put it in the kiln and burn out the teddy bear so it's hollow. Every once in a while you can hear something jingle around inside. 
Um, then I have this very fragile shell of an old children's memory, a teddy bear. Wow. And, but there's, still, there's something missing, so I started kind of playing with color, and I, I fell into painting them with this tar, which is basically rubberized under undercoating of, of cars. So I spray it on there. And Undercoating it gives it, of what we use on our automobiles. Yes, it's exact, I bought it from Walmart. Uh -huh. It's like $3 a can. Um, it gave me the ability to give this something you could feel when you touched it. If you drag your finger across it, sometimes it comes off. Um, and it made them a little more rigid because they were very fragile. Some of them are as thin as eggshells. Some of them are a little more sturdy, but I, I really like the thin ones. I like that they will break at some point. If I step on one being on the floor, kind of precariously stacked like this, they break. They're, How they're, long have you been doing these? Uh, I've been doing the teddy bears for about three years, off and on. Um, there's times when I work on them a lot, and then there's times when I don't work on them at all. Mm -hmm. um, now, where does this come from inside of you? I mean, is this a childhood memory, or is it some it's, it's, painful struggle that you're going uh, through? I think it was just a little bit of deviousness. Uh, like <laughs> I said, one of my professors in graduate school would bring me the teddy bears a lot, uh -huh. and I would destroy the teddy bears. And she passed the teddy bears around like they were a feather, like a hippie campfire meeting, where yeah. you could only speak if you had the feather. Right. In class, you could only speak if you had the teddy bear. Every time it was my turn, <laughs> when I passed the teddy bear back, it was either inside out or its head was on the bottom. <laughs> Um, so That's then how she, you spoke to the bear, huh? Yes. So she started bringing me these things. Oh, well, if you're going to be this fun with my teddy bears, what are you going to do if I could bring you 200? And she kind of challenged me to make something. So this was my way of being more devious. Well, I'm going to destroy them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dunk them, drown them, burn them, hang them, burn them again, and then tar and feather them. I think my son would love your art. <laughs> Tell us what you call this. Um, I just I label everything pretty much what it is as an object. These are just teddy bears. Wow. Um, well, th there was a photo of this in the Sun Herald, and I couldn't quite make out from what it was made, you know. And it seemed to have been almost luminous in a way. But it, now that I see it, it's just a stack of burned teddy bears. Yeah, and that's really all it is. You take each one apart, and they're teddy bears. Right now, they're a stack of teddy bears. Um, it was basically just a fun way to show them because you can't tell what they are from far away. No, when you walk you up, you kind of get past I thought you were going to build a fire here in the middle of the I, art gallery. Everybody thought it was a campfire. <laughs> right. um, and it was, we played with it when we came in. Actually, one of the students here helped me set it up, and I asked her what she thought I should do. And she kind of was like, let's do a pile on the floor. I said, all right, let's do a pile on the floor. I, I mean, it's fun to play with these things. I like them to just be where they are right now. Next time I show them, they may be somewhere else. They may be hung up. They may be sitting on a pedestal. But for now, they're a pile on the floor. Well, and that brings to mind the floating chickens that are around this gallery right now, and they're hidden everywhere. There's one in place of an overhead light. There's one by another piece of art. There's one hiding by the surfboard. So right on the why don't we go and visit one of the chickens? Which one do you want to go and we see? We can go to this Let's one. Let's go to the, this the closest. one right over here, shall we? Okay. Tell us about the chickens. We've got teddy bears, chickens, and then we've got beautiful pottery. The chicken heads are kind of a throwback to how I originally got into art as a child. And I mean art as art, not as making things. Uh -huh. I was living in the suburbs of Philadelphia, and I really got influenced by graffiti writers. So I started writing graffiti at about 14 years old. And well, it took me down a couple of paths. It got me in trouble a lot. I got arrested a few times. But it really got me interested in drawing and just painting and things of that nature. Um, and then I started. I stopped writing graffiti and decided I was going to go to college and make something of myself instead of being a hooligan in the streets. And throughout the years, I refused to incorporate graffiti into anything that I did. I wanted to leave that back in my childhood and come into, I guess, what you would call the fine arts. Mm -hmm. Well, these are kind of me making fun of the graffiti writers, but also almost falling back into it. Um, I was having a conversation with a friend a few months ago about graffiti hasn't changed much in 30 years. It's right. about the same. People still write their names on the walls. Some people paint images of themselves or their persona. And I said, well, I just live in the south in this weird southern town, and there's really no room for graffiti here. It doesn't fit. The things that fit around here are kitsch objects that fit in your kitchen. And through that conversation, I started thinking, wouldn't it be funny if I would make these very kitsch 50s rooster heads and glue them up on the walls in New York City? So the long-term goal is to take these up to Manhattan and actually glue them on the walls as graffiti and just have no name, no association with the person, they have to come up with what to call it on their own. It's just a chicken head stuck somewhere. Um, so these are the first actual 18 of these that I've made. And I've decided to kind of place them around the studio a little bit more, I guess, with a little bit more fun behind them. They're, some oh, of them are it. hidden. It's filled with whimsy. There's, there's one way up there. I had to climb the wall, much, much like when I wrote oh, graffiti, I, I had to climb the wall. See if um, you can find the chicken heads as we do this show. So there's, there's 
17. There were supposed to be 18, but I broke one. They are made <laughs> out of clay. And so sometimes things break on me too, and it's okay. I'll make another one. I have mold. Well, I feel sure that when we go to Manhattan, we're going to see Ian Childers' chicken heads, but we won't tell them that they're yours. That's, that's good. Okay. Well, they may, somebody else could make a copy and make their own, so they, they may not be mine. In They'll New York? Mine. You think that's going to happen? It's possible. Got more. That's what they would tell the lawyer. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, <laughs> this is an amazing show. Every show we do here on Artbeat is wonderful, but this beautiful young professor from Rome, Georgia, has treated us to an eclectic array of art, as I said earlier. And we're going to come back and look at some more of his beautiful pottery and the surfboard and find out how you made it and why right after we take this short break. So don't leave Artbeat. Stay with us. Welcome back to Artbeat. In a few minutes, a whole array of people are coming into the gallery to meet and greet Mr. Ian Childers, and it's no wonder because his art is so unusual for Jackson County, Mississippi, <laughs> and I tell you, it must be unusual for Rome, Georgia, too. A little bit, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so it's... especially these skulls. Now, do tell us about how you came to create those. The skulls were similar to the chicken heads. Um, I've always had a fascination for skulls, one from working at a tattoo shop at nights. Um, Skulls are very big into the, the entire tattoo oh, scene. Of course, Two, yeah. skulls are the basis of human identity. It's something that everybody has. Everyone can have a skull, and, and it, it creates what you look like. So I've always found skulls to be relatively beautiful. Um, so when I was thinking about doing skulls, I kind of looked around, and I wanted a very kind of flat skull that I could hang on a wall. It wasn't a full skull. I wanted one that was almost cartoony. And I decided to just do a series of hundreds of these skulls, and I would paint about half of them or decorate them in some way, shape, or form. Well, how many are here right now? Let's take a walk. Uh, there's about 50, 60 here. 50 or 60. I've lost count, which And of is good. course, the one over here is being babysat by a chicken head. Yes. <laughs> this is actually a, uh, this is a horse skull. Yes, it is. was from the drawing class at my college, and they decided to throw it out. And I dove into the dumpster and grabbed it because I saw potential in it. It already had spray paint all over. All the blues were already spray painted. So I decided to just draw some warm colors, some yellows and oranges and reds, to do this skull that was very reminiscent of one of the Mexican Day of the Dead skulls. It is. Um, I can which, see that. Which was El very strictly... Los Muertes. Sí. Yes. It was very strictly <laughs> kind of influenced by the tattoo shop itself. I actually painted this at the tattoo shop while I was at work and bored. And I just felt it went along with the rest of these skulls. Well, I have to say that the colors that you used are so vivid. And this rose is almost blood red. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's gorgeous, and it's so defined. It's um, it's paint marker from Michael's. Is crafts. it really? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's so you're so subdued about what you do. So, uh, and here we are in the middle of this wonderful showing, and all all the people are showing up. But let's just talk briefly about some of the pieces that you have here. I know that we have bowls that are very functional, but I also see an array of bottles and vases. Now, that's somewhat unusual, and especially the textures that you use. How do you decide? I play. These things are all really studio playtime for me. Mm -hmm. I get in the studio and I decide what I want to make at any certain time. Um, these two in particular are part of a set of ten, only two of which actually came out. Um, and it was a conversation with a friend who's a, who's a moonshine runner. Oh, you're kidding me. And he was talking about liquor bottles and liquor jugs. <laughs> they do look like that. So I made these almost decanter kind of bottles and I wanted to have a little bit of, of a texture on the side instead of a very smooth and boring bottle. So I, just made a several of these. There's only one set that I made. I'll probably revisit them sooner or later. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they were just kind of fun to make. And pretty much everything I make in clay is, I want to make this. This is fun. And then I get bored and make something else. Uh, but I never leave anything all back. I come back to everything. So I'll come back and make more of these at some point. Well, a Moonshiner sure would be lucky to have this and probably wouldn't be arrested if he did use this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, probably. I mean, they're, they're very pretty. I do like them. I don't know how functional they would be. I've, not, a, not much of a drinker myself, so I don't know much about liquor bottles. I just think it's fun to give my interpretation of a non-drinking person's it's drinking person's bottle. But now, how does it feel when you say things get broken and they don't come out? When I was first in the ceramics, I really got upset. I was. I bet. My heart was in every single piece. Now, there's hundreds of pieces in here. This is only four months worth of work, oh. um, and for these hundreds of pieces, probably a thousand pieces were made. Wow. Because I'm rambunctious. I, I knock things over. I break things. I fire things too quickly, I paint something and it comes out ter terribly, so I smash it. So these are just things. He's I make new thing. things. I have the ability to make them, so I don't, I don't get upset when I don't have one anymore. I'll just make another. Well, he would be upset if something happened to his surfboard, and you're going to see the beauty of his first surfboard, which there will yes. be many more, I hope, Hopefully. right after we take a short break. 
From the functional to the sublime to the utterly fantastic, you've been listening and watching the work of Ian Shelders. And of course, you held this entire group utterly captivated. I mean, they were simply... First time ever. I doubt that seriously. What are some of the questions you got from them? Um, I got a lot of people just ask how I chose to do things. Um, not much technical stuff, which is good because I don't like to answer all the technical right, questions right. in front of everyone. Um, just look how much work it took. I think I kind of impressed them when I said it was four months worth of work, not not four years. Um, and how then, much work was this? This was about three weeks, two, two and a half to three weeks worth of work. Um, you can't do it all day, every day, so it was just a few hours every day. You take, it's got to be like really tiring on physically. It really, It really wasn't. There's a lot of machinery nowadays that does all the job mm -hmm. for you. It was just all the wood was run through a, a surface planer, which made it all the same thickness. And then I would glue, there's this little light strip here, I glue it to this strip. That's the day, that's the first that's half so of the day. That's beautiful. I would come back in the afternoon and glue this strip. Wow. Then I'd come back the next morning, glue this strip, the next afternoon, this strip. So every day it was another piece farther through it. Well, I'm so amazed by the detail on the rudder of the, of the surfboard, too. Yeah, the fin was, it was a fun thing to make. I, th that took a lot of math. The rest of this took some math, but this took the most math to make sure I had the right angle on it and everything like that. Well, um, you know, it looks like Ian has come into this world just sort of free form, but you have a really strong background in academia. I guess. Well, uh huh. Well, that's a good answer. Okay, <laughs> Master of Fine Arts. Yes, I have a Master of Fine Arts okay. from the University of Massachusetts. University of Massachusetts. So it's not like you're telling students here, oh, just wake up in the morning and decide to do art. There's a learning process. Oh yeah, I, I mean, I got into art writing graffiti and then going to tattoo shops. Right. But that wasn't it. Wasn't high art. That's considered outside art. Now that I'm on the inside, I learn these things. Right. Um, <laughs> and then I decided I wanted to go to college. And when I got into college, I didn't know if I wanted to be an art major or an art minor. I didn't know if art was important to me. I liked the idea of just getting a job and working 40 hours a week, being a lawyer or a doctor, whatever I would end up being. Uh -huh. And then I met my, college, my first college professor, a man named Steve Frazier. He was like, well, you could be me. I said, what do you mean? He goes, you could be a professor. You could teach art. And there's a 40 hour a week job being an artist. And I was like, well, that's wow. what I want to do. Absolutely. So I, I think it was my freshman year, I decided that I wanted to try to become an art professor. So I made myself a five year plan to get out of college and try to get into graduate school, which would have been the next step. And then I got it into graduate school at the University of Massachusetts in 2005 and spent three years there. And as soon as I graduated, I got a call from my undergraduate school, Shorter University, saying they had an opening and wanted to know if I wanted to come back. And I was like, absolutely. I think it would be great to go back and just teach the same student, not the same students, but the same kind of people that I would, I'd been myself for four years. So I went back and it's been, it's been a really awesome couple of years there. What, do you see a similarity in the student bodies that you teach or that you see here at our junior college? Yes, you know, every school is so different. At UMass, the students were so incredibly different than the kids at Shorter. The kids here, I'm proud, I haven't met many of them, but I'm sure they're extremely different from the students at my school. Mm -hmm. But I like looking around, everybody's generally interested. At this point, they have so much potential. It's once they get out of school and they decide they want to work at a gas station, then they ruin it all. But Right now, everybody's like, I want to learn, I want to learn. So I look at every one of them as in, hey, I can teach you everything I know. And it's, it's really fun to look at people like that, well, just to so look at the, the fun. philosophy, you, you're so varied, and, and you know, we need to talk about why the surfboard, but before we do, what is your philosophy about art? It takes hard work. It takes hard work. It's pretty much it. Anybody can learn to be an artist. I don't know if they necessarily be good or bad artists, but you can be an artist. All you have to do is work, especially in clay. I can teach anybody how to work in clay. It's just a matter of sitting down and doing it. Mm -hmm. um, all the rest of the ideas are their own, but for me, when I first started working with clay, I was terrible. For two years, I could barely make anything, and then I got bored and I would go down to the studio late at night and just work extra hours. Every time I make a cup, it gets a little better. Even today, seven or eight years after I started doing it, everything I make is better than the piece before. Wow. Um, and it's, it's a constant learning curve. It's it just, is a constant. Every time I make something, I learn, oh, don't put so much pressure as I pull or push the clay, add more of this, take less of this out. Even with the wood, every, every time you touch it, it's, it's more knowledge. So, you know, the eternal question mark, which was something that stands before me when I speak with you, there are many questions, and one of them is this. Why the surfboard? We know why the pottery, we know why the skulls, but why the surfboard? Well, I took up surfing when I was in UMass, and I had a friend who had several surfboards, and he would let me go with him, and he actually forced me to go with him. In the middle of winter, it was 20 below zero the first time I went. It was a terrifying experience. I but. Bet. But a wetsuit really keeps you warm, more than I thought it would. And I decided I wanted a surfboard. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I had the ability to do was make things, not buy things. So I couldn't just go out and buy. I didn't have $800 to buy a surfboard. I had $200 to gather all the parts and buy the polyurethane to build one. 
So this is actually the siding off of a house in Massachusetts. Wow. That's recycled cedar siding because it was kind of about being a green Beautiful. project. And then these two strips right here of red came from a piece of cherry molding that was in my studio that had been hanging there for years. Then the rest is a pine tree that the, the wood shop technician cut down in his backyard. Have you ever surfed on it? I have once. One That's time. it. I, I finished the surfboard right before I moved to Georgia. I started it and with, with hopes of getting through an entire summer in Massachusetts surfing and ended up being pushed off by other things. So I didn't get started until too late. Finished it, got everything done, polyurethaned it, and I had to let the polyurethane cure for two weeks that I, didn't, I was not aware of when I first started. Mm -hmm. So it put me three weeks behind where I wanted to be originally. So then I, and I was offered the job at Shorter at that time, so it was, it was kind of like, well, I've got my surfboard, I can take it out, but then I have to leave. <laughs> so now I'm stuck with it and I get to look at it, and every time a swell comes up on the East Coast, I feel like driving, but I'm, I'm five and a half hours from the closest beach. Well, we have beaches here in Mississippi. We want you to stay. It's the Gulf Coast. There's not much surf here. Oh, I know. But you'll be safe. <laughs> Trust yeah. me. You've met him as the surfer and the potter and the skull and dug remaker, but now you're going to meet him as the tattoo artist when we return right after this message. <laughs> Welcome back to Art Beat. In case you have just joined us, we have been talking and laughing and greeting and meeting Ian Childers. He's a fabulous artist from Rome, Georgia. And now we've seen you as a potter, a skull maker, the chicken man, <laughs> the uh, what, surfer, really, yes. the surfer that you are. And now you're a tattoo artist. Do tell us how you got involved with this. Well, tattooing was one of my first fortes in art altogether. Really? Um, I got into it. I had a friend that was learning how to tattoo in 1993 when I was living in Philadelphia. And he convinced me to let him tattoo me. So he did, and since then I've been collecting. And in about 95, I got my first apprenticeship as a tattoo artist. So I lived and worked as an apprentice in tattooing for three or four years. The moment I finished my apprenticeship and I was certified to tattoo, I quit and moved to Georgia to go to college. Um, I went through several years of college, graduate school, came back to where I'm at now. The first week I was back, I met the guy that owned the tattoo shop in town. Mm -hmm. And we had a conversation. He was extremely intelligent. I was kind of thrown off that he was so intelligent for a tattoo shop owner. Right. That Not that they're be. dumb people, but he just seemed a little bit overly educated uh -huh. to be a guy. And he had no tattoos visible, so I was confused. And as we talked, <laughs> we, we ended up creating a friendship, and then he offered me a job working at a shop. And I said, sure, I have something to do at night times now. Hey, did you know that you could be a tattoo artist, or did you just... I did. Just... I mean, I'd already apprenticed, and I'd already okay. learned. So uh, I had to do a refresher, right because right. I, I'd been out for almost 10 years at that point. That's a but, long time. Yeah. But he got me back into it, um, and it was, it was fun, but I realized I didn't really want to tattoo all that much. I, I kind of liked making things instead, and tattooing was drawing something and leaving it on somebody, and then they left, and I couldn't keep it. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's art that leaves. <laughs> yes, so I, I started getting into making things while I was there, um, and I started building these tattoo machines, and this one was, was built actually out of the, the, the coils from the doorbell at my house, and this, these are about 100-year-old doorbell you, How did you know that, that uh, you needed a doorbell? I mean, where is the doorbell? Well, the doorbell is gone. The doorbell would actually be, these two coils create an electromagnet, okay. and when the current is sent through, they pull this little armature bar down. When it comes down, it breaks this little cont contact here, which brings the spring to pull it back up. This is a series of, of circuits going up and down, up and down. Um, and the same thing works with the doorbell. At the end, there's a hammer, and it hits a bell as it comes down each time. With a tattoo machine, the needle sticks here, and it comes down through the bottom and comes out as the needle. So you have your tube that you hold on to, needle at the end, and this is your armature bar that... Unbelievable. So you have three, uh, three of these. Actually, well, well four. this is four. Yeah, I have a left-handed and a right-handed one here that look good next to each other that I made specifically for this show. Absolutely beautiful, um, the way you've displayed them. I love that. Yeah, I thought it would be fun to just kind of put them a little bit more formally. You don't usually see tattoo machines shown as art, but there really is a lot of art into it. And in the tattoo world, people really covet arty, artsy tattoo machines. Yeah. So it was really fun to make a series like this one looks like it's 100 years old to match the doorbells. And we cast it in brass in the backyard of the shop. These ones have been just welded together out of some, some machine steels. So they look much cleaner. They've been painted. More modern. Yeah, and this one, the coils, I made the coils myself, wrapped them with the wire, and oh, then wrapped them in dollar bills. I don't know if you can see bills. this. Yeah, you can pull it out. Can they I come, pull it out? They come out. There you go. There is a dollar bill wrapped around the coils. It gives it a little bit of more of an artsy. And it was green, it matched the machine itself. Yeah, and it brings money into your life. <laughs> Sometimes, yes. Hopefully. <laughs> Sometimes, no. Well, you know, I have to ask you now that you have your shoes and socks off, how did you come to tattoo the bottom of your feet? When I was in graduate school, I had never done any tattoo-based art. You have to show art. the camera a little bit. All right, so this is the bottoms of one of my feet. Um, when I was in graduate school, I, was, I spent six weeks at the tattoo shop while I was on winter break. and I couldn't make anything there that I could show for my thesis show, and I couldn't collect anything from an artist that I couldn't 
that I could call my own. So uh -huh. I decided the best thing was to tattoo the bottom of my foot because it was one place I had open and one place I could reach. So I did a video piece where I tattooed a half of a skull, which comes together like this, okay. on the bottom of my feet. Uh, it was extremely painful and uncomfortable, but it's still in there after three or four years now. Now, do you have a special affinity for the tattoo art above the other kind of art? Or I, is I everything pretty tattoos. equal? It's all equal. I, I mean, everything inspires me. I, I'm really a tattoo collector, not as much tattoo artist. I really just, I, I've got tattoos by dozens of famous artists from all over the country. I've paid way too much money for some of the tattoos, but I get a lot of them for free since I work in the industry as well. And you carry your um, art with you. Yeah. Now, since I have a day job, I have to be relatively clean cut. I can pull my sleeves up and there's really nothing visible. So, because I have to try to be a little bit more responsible with my job as a teacher. Um, yeah. But I don't think tattoos should carry the stigma. They, they do. And Very I have to good. Be aware of that. Absolutely. So, You're absolutely but right. I, it's really, and it's not as crazy as a, as a scene as some people come mm -hmm. to think. If you've never been tattooed, you might have one. You think tattoo artists are crazy people. Most of them just work really hard and don't make a lot of money. And they're um, artists. They're true and they're, artists. And they're artists. Yeah, they draw yeah. on people. They color for a living. It's a yeah, fun job. Absolutely. But it's not, it's not really associated with, with bad people. It's, there's all kinds of people into it now, which is really fun. Well, I tell you what's been fun has been this show. I've been smiling and laughing throughout it. Ian Childers has been our guest on Artbeat. And you can see his art here at the Fine Arts Gallery at the Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College campus here in Gautier, Mississippi. And this runs through November the 5th, I do believe. Yes. From now, which is October the 7th through November the 5th, just come on in and see it and you will be amazed. And listen up. If you have any artists that you want us to put on this show, please email us at WKFK.com and we'll be sure and interview them. And Ian, I have to say, please don't go back to Rome, Georgia. Do stay in Mississippi. We've I'll loved having it. you. I, this town is very nice. It's very nice. Thanks for joining us. Thank Thanks you. for watching. We'll see you again next week.